Welcome everyone, and thank you for, uh, for attending today's webinar, Prisoners Advice Service, Fathers in Prison, Contact with Children Publication Launch. Before we launch into the program, we have a few housekeeping items to address. Please note this webinar is being recorded. We encourage you to submit questions for our speakers at any time during the program via the Q&A feature. We will answer submitted questions throughout the webinar and at the end of the program as time permits. With housekeeping matters behind us, I will turn things over to Tom. Great, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, just absolutely delighted to welcome, welcome everybody here today to our discussion about Fathers in Prison and to the launch of our latest toolkit, our family guide, Fathers in Prison, Contact with Children. We have a brilliant lineup of panelists for you today. My colleague Kate will introduce to you shortly. But first, I want to talk briefly about the guide we're launching today. This is the latest in the past series of self-help toolkits for prisoners. These toolkits help prisoners to understand and undertake some of the simpler legal processes for themselves, many of which are sadly no longer funded by legal aid. We created this guide in response to the number of, the number of queries PAS routinely receives from male prisoners who are unable to access free help to understand what their options are when they want to have contact with their children and to remain involved in their children's lives. We believe that someone being in prison should not prevent them from being a parent or from being involved in their child's life. As Chris says in his foreword to the guide, even with two parents committed to maintaining a strong father-son relationship, the reality of the system doesn't make this easy. So we wanted to provide a practical, accessible toolkit to support fathers in prison, to try to make the process of fathers maintaining contact and staying involved in their children's lives clearer and easier to access. Creating this guide has been made possible thanks to the generous support of 7BR Barristers Chambers and the Matrix Causes Fund. We're incredibly grateful for your support and of course to Rose Harvey Sullivan in particular for your time and expertise. I'm delighted now to hand over to our moderator of the evening, Kate Lill. Kate has been here with us at PAS since 2015 as part of our caseworker team with a focus on women prisoners and has been a key part of creating this toolkit. So without further ado, Kate, I'll hand over to you. Standard technical error, unmute. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. Um, yes, we've got four great panellists to speak about their experiences tonight. Um, so we're going to listen to those first and then have a Q&A session. Some people have submitted questions already, um, which panellists can answer, but please feel free to use the Q&A um, function on the Zoom to ask questions throughout if you'd like to. So first, we've got Rose Harvey Sullivan speaking. She is the author of the, the toolkit, as Tom said. She's a barrister at 7BR Chambers. Um, she has a mixed civil and family practice, and she specializes in representing vulnerable clients in family law, clinical negligence, and personal injury claims, inquests, and court of protection cases. She's previously worked in criminal law too. Prior to becoming a barrister, Rose worked in prison reform in Bangladesh, she maintains a keen interest in this area, which is basically what brought her to Paz. Um, then we will have Chris Aikens, who is going to talk to us about his own experience of being a father in prison. Chris is a BAFTA nominated filmmaker and author. He is a best-selling author of A Bit of a Stretch, which is a book about his time spent at h and Wandsworth. He also hosts a podcast, which is also called A Bit of a Stretch, where he interviews people about their experiences of being in prison. We'll then hear from Charlie Weinberg, who is the director of Safe Ground, and she's been there since 2010. And Safe Ground are a third sector organisation responsible for the design and delivery of the first ever family relationships programmes in UK prisons, and that's been going since 2005. Safe Ground runs a range of therapeutic arts based group work programmes in custody and in the community across the UK, as well as contributing to policy and holding public arts events annually. And then finally, we will hear from Amanda Emerson from PACT. Um, Amanda is a family engagement manager with um, PACT based at HMP Sudbury. Her role is to help men in prison and their families to maintain and build strong family ties. She's passionate about casework and is particularly interested in child contact issues. I will hand over to Rose. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, well, I'm really pleased to be here today and uh, really, really 
grateful to pass for um letting me work with you um it's it's been a real pleasure uh, and we've had a lot of support in getting the guide together so um it's great to be launching it today and to have it in hard copy in all the prisons um what i'm planning to talk about uh, just for five or ten minutes uh, is firstly um the, the reasons why it's important for families and fathers to have contact with their children. Um, not only is it good for them, but it's good for uh, the children themselves. So I'm going to touch on that briefly. Uh, I'm then going to talk a little bit about um, the options that are available to uh, fathers in prison in terms of contact. Um, but I won't talk about that in any great detail because there are far more experienced on this experienced people on this panel who know more about that than me. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is how litigants in person deal with court hearings and some of the difficulties that they have faced and the ways in which the system is starting to uh, make things a little bit easier for them. So turning to the first of those topics, uh, that's the question of, uh, sort of why is this a good thing in the first place? Um, I think most people who are attending today are probably aware of the fact that uh, family ties and maintaining good relationships is one of the most effective ways to reduce uh, re-offending uh, that we have. I think the Pharma Review um, that came out a, 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 two years ago now um, described it as a golden thread running through the criminal justice system. Now, unfortunately, it's all too common that judges at the sentencing end uh, don't take into account the impact on families and children when they are sentencing individuals um, who have committed crimes. And we still have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, but certainly there is an increasing awareness that when uh, individuals have contact with their families uh, whilst they are in prison, they are far more likely to um, have a better outcome once they're released and also far more likely to, to um, do better in prison, so are less likely to develop uh, serious mental health issues, and are far more likely to um, sort of uh, keep on keep on a, a, a perhaps a positive track, knowing that there are good reasons for them to be released, uh, and have things to look forward to at the other end. Um, I, I think um, there is there are various studies that deal with um, the statistical. Uh, facts of how this works. Um, there are more relating to women than to men um, and for perhaps obvious reasons uh, and stereotypical reasons um, the impact on female prisoners uh, being separated from their children is far more studied um, and something that we, we know a lot more about but certainly in terms of women for example we know that they're 39% less likely to re-offend if they maintain the con contact with families. Um, it's, I think the figures are slightly lower for men, but still very significant. Um, and part of that is about uh, knowing that there is something to work hard for uh, at the point of release. But also, as I say, it's about maintaining um, human ties and that sense of support and solidarity whilst on the inside. Um, in terms of children themselves, we know that children who have contact with their parents whilst the parent is in prison have, have much improved outcomes as well. Studies show that they end up with higher self-esteem. The obvious benefits of knowing that your parent is still there and still loves you, um, I, I, I'm sure, are clear to most of us. Um, but also children present with um, fewer signs of, and symptoms of things like low mood or sadness, anxiety, and also they're less likely for themselves to, be become, to become involved in criminal activity. So really there are some very, very um, tangible and positive reasons to make sure that, that prisoners can have contact with their families. Um, the reality is, you know, regardless of a parent having done something illegal, um, the children themselves shouldn't be punished for that. And of course, having a parent taken away does feel like a punishment for children. So it's really important, we think, um, that that doesn't impact too heavily on them in that way. Um, and that they, they benefit from being allowed to see their parents and of course that has to be in an appropriate and safe way and so that's really where things like this guide comes into play because one of the difficulties of course is that sometimes people will suggest that prisoners ought not to have contact with their children or that it wouldn't be in the child's best interests and so there can be a real source of that can be a real source of um, dispute and disagreement particularly if partners have split up at the point that one's going into prison um, I know that other individuals on the panel have experienced that there can be incredibly supportive partners of people who end up in prison. And I know Chris, for example, had a, a fantastic ex-partner when he was in prison who, who really supported and facilitated his relationship with his son. Um, but sadly, that's not the case for everybody. So in terms of, um, in terms of being able to, to support prisoners in, in accessing contact opportunities with their children, um, this guide, we hope, will be useful to them in that sense. 
Um, I think it's already been mentioned, but legal aid, of course, has been massively cut in the last years. And um, not only are we seeing that in the family courts outside of cases involving prisoners, but of course it massively affects um, prisoners because there are far fewer opportunities or things that are available to individuals who are inside as opposed to having community links or being able to look for support elsewhere. So that, that cut to the legal aid has, has hit prisoners particularly hard. Um, I know that Pat is frequently asked about um, what they might be able to do to help um, fathers who are, who are um, in prison and are not having contact with their families. Uh, and so um, this guide came about as a result of um, my having some family law experience and that being a, a common area that they're asked about and, and didn't have the uh, facilities in house to provide the guide. Um, in terms of the guide itself, uh, in very brief terms, I don't know how many people have already had a chance to look at it. I think it's been on the website a little bit, but obviously is only being launched today. Um, but we've we've set it up so that it's designed as a very sort of straightforward, practical uh, tool for individuals to use. Of course, it's estimated, I think, that about 60% of the prison population have some difficulties in terms of literacy. So the guide itself is, is set out in a really clear format with things like case studies and specific examples to give, um, to give the individual using it uh, a good understanding of how the legal principles might be applied in practice. So we've tried to cut out the lawyer speak, basically. <laughs> um, we, so the first, one of the first things we've set out in there is what's called parental responsibility. So who has a right to have contact with a child? Um, of course, there are all sorts of um, different family arrangements these days with step parents or, or um, carers who live with children for long periods of time without being married or in civil partnerships, etc. So the system is starting to be much more fluid in terms of parental responsibility to allow and recognize the fact that there are all sorts of different arrangements. So we've tried to set out uh, in clear terms who in terms of children a, a, a man in prison might be allowed to have contact with somebody they've been very close to, for example, or a child that might be their but not might not be their biological child but who's lived with them for some years so that they're clear as to who they, they who they might be able to have contact with um we've then gone on to um to set out a little bit about the types of contact that um fathers might be able to have access to so um the types of indirect contact there's obviously fantastic services like storybook dads that are set up that um, allow fathers one way of having indirect contact with their kids without necessarily sort of speaking to them directly um, on the phone each day. Obviously, it goes without saying there are things like phone calls, purple visits, and of course, there's direct contact. And in many prisons, um, the services are being better set up these days to be a bit more child friendly. I know some have things like soft play areas uh, and, you know, uh, book corners and all those kinds of aspects, which make it a lot more feasible and viable for kids to come in and see their dads. So all of those sorts of things are set out in there so that um, men know what sort of things they can be asking for and thinking about. Um, we've focused in the guide also on ways in which dads might be able to have contact with their kids without actually having to come to court. Because um, even though lots of us on the team today are lawyers, we fully recognise that actually if we can stay out of things, then it's much better for everybody involved. <laughs> so, um, so we've set out in the guide ways in which the um, men might want to think about how they could communicate with the carer of their kids to have some contact. Um, uh, maybe there are issues that you know they, they just haven't been speaking about or don't fully understand one another on and so we've we've set out some of the things they might want to think about things like mediation using a friend or family member or people they might be able to talk to in prison um, so that they can try and resolve things without having to resort to court um, much as we would with any client on the outside as well and then we've gone on to set out the types of order that uh, that dads might, or men might want to consider um, seeking from the court. So the main one, of course, is a child arrangements order and um, to have that direct contact. But of course, there are other types of order, things like specific issue orders about big decisions, like a child moving across the country, for example, um, that a parent or carer might want to have some involvement in. So we've set all those aspects out in there. And then we've dealt with the practical aspects of how you might go about making an application for yourself. So the really basic aspects, what, which, which number is the form in question, you know, the, 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 the C1 or the C2A, whatever it is, we've set those out on the, in the guide, as well as the fees that are involved and how you might apply for an exemption for those fees. Um, and, and when Kate and I were doing the podcast the other day for, for this launch event, we were talking about the, the fact that these are things I think some of us take for granted, that that's something you could quite easily Google, but actually that's really not necessarily the case. So we've tried to be comprehensive in that way. 
Um, and then we've set out the sort of questions that a judge is going to ask so that individuals know what they need to focus on in their forms and papers so that they can get it all down on, on paper. Um, as I said, being a litigant in person, though, is actually a really difficult thing. And as we don't have so much legal aid anymore, um, and certainly not for most men in these situations, um, one of the big and scary issues for men making these applications is what happens when it comes to actual court hearings or what happens if they don't get the papers correct or they haven't put in the right information. Um, and so that's that's one thing that we've touched on in the guide in terms of um, how they might want to address things and, and specifically the kind of questions a judge is going to ask. And what I wanted to touch on today is just very briefly the fact that courts are starting to get better at dealing with litigants in person and, and even in cases not involving uh, an individual in prison actually they're sometimes really surprised to see a lawyer pop up in private law family proceedings um, over a contact dispute because it's so common that people can't afford to have lawyers anymore um, and don't get legal aid for it so judges are increasingly trained on how to deal with litigants in person and are much more sympathetic um, so we're hoping that um, they will be increasingly flexible in that way. And they should be giving uh, individuals directions as to what they need to put in documents. Uh, and so we set out, I think, some of the questions that, uh, that men might want to ask a judge and so that they know what to put in future documents. And so that's something we cover in the last section of the, of the guide. But certainly that's something that um, we'll be looking to work on more. And, and in terms of those practical aspects of when it comes to the court itself, I know that it's sometimes case specific. So one of the things that we're talking about with PASS is perhaps offering, when it's all things are fully up and running again, um, offering the opportunity to do some talks in prisons um, to advise individuals who might be making these kinds of applications on what they need to do when it gets to the, the hearing stage. So um, watch this space really for that aspect, but we'll be moving on to that. So um, hopefully that gives a really brief rundown of the reasons why we put the guide together and also a little bit about the guide itself and what it contains. Hopefully for those of you working with prisoners in these sorts of situations it's going to prove a useful starting point and a tool to find the right information and, and um, know what, what questions you need to be asking to make these kinds of applications. So hopefully it will help benefit dads and children in the future. Thanks Kate. Thanks very much Rose. Um, obviously quite significant legal difficulties there for, for fathers in, in, in prison, particularly in the absence of, of legal aid, but some positive news actually to hear that the courts are becoming better, better sort of versed and experienced at dealing with litigants in person and, and trying to assist in, in these cases. Um, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> yes, as has been said, my name's Chris Atkins. I'm a who was it? Well, I still am, I suppose, filmmaker uh, and journalist. And almost exactly five years ago, I was sent to prison. Um, uh, very briefly, because people always want to know what did he do. I, um, I I funded a film using a uh, a tax avoidance scheme that uh, turned out to be um, uh, pretty shady. And HMRC kind of came in and prosecuted everyone involved. And I got five years, which meant I would serve two and a half. Um, and obviously the big thing today is about the, the uh, fact that I had a son, I had a young son uh, at the time. So um, he uh, he's called Kit. He's almost nine now. So he was four. He was three when I got sent down and then he, he turned four a couple of weeks later. Um, and I'd actually split up with his mother, Lottie, uh, a couple of years before I went away. But we were, remained on very good terms and we lived very close to each other and we would share our son, Kit, um, 50-50, this is before I went to prison. So when I was convicted, suddenly, it, I'd just been through a very, very sort of traumatic and stressful trial in which I was sort of the focus. And there was this whole group of friends who would come to the trial every day. And, you know, everyone was sort of wondering, you know, was I gonna get off and following all the, the machinations, really the legal process. And then suddenly when I was convicted, it was like, oh my God, the, the attention sort of quite dramatically then had to shift to my son. Cause it's like, oh my God, Chris is gonna go away for quite a serious amount of time. And how's his son going to cope and how's their relationship going to survive and, and so kit sort of became the sort of focus really um, of that and as rose said i was very very fortunate that my uh, partner lottie was absolutely dedicated uh, in and convinced that we should obviously keep the family uh bond alive between me and my son um and actually when i went to prison for the first time so i got a uh, five years so i went to wandsworth prison um uh, she was the first person I called, actually, because I also knew her number by heart. And you've got to sort of 
dial in. You've got two minutes. So I thought, well, I'm going to call my ex because my, my, my son was there. Just, just let her know where I was and that I was safe. Um, but she was absolutely brilliant. So she was, she was adamant that I'd, um, uh, that he would come and visit me. And that, that's a really big kind of question that people have when they end up in prison is, are the kids going to come and see you or not? Um, and what happens in some cases, in fact, I'm sad to say that some of the people I knew from my time inside have now gone back inside. Um, and in one case, a guy called Mark, I want to give you a surname, um, has just gone back inside for dealing drugs. And he's, he's got five years sentence as well. And I went to see his wife recently. Um, and, and they've made a decision not to tell the kids where their father is. So they've said, you know, that, you know, daddy's away doing work in Africa or something. The kids are quite young. Um, uh, and so you can sort of speak to them on the phone, but um, they've made a decision to not tell the kids where the father is. I'm, I'm not going to judge anyone, each to their own. Lottie and I didn't think that was right. Because obviously if you make that choice, it means you then don't get to visit them. You don't get to see them. But at least if you admit you're in prison, it means the advantage is you do get to sort of, you do get to see them. And also Lottie, who's much smarter than me about all these things, she thought that at some point, if you said that to Kit, he's going to find out. And then he'll feel as though he's been wrong twice, really. He's been, he's been, um, he's been lied to by his parents and then they will feel betrayed by us as well. So we made the decision that he would come visit me as soon as possible. But that wasn't our decision to make in a sense because actually what we had to do was to try and get him approved to visit. And that was a really difficult thing to do. And I talk about this a lot in my book. Um, so you have to, in order to get someone approved to visit, you have to fill in a form. And, to do anything in prison you had to fill, fill in dozens and dozens of forms most of which never get read so i had to keep filling in these forms saying putting kit's name and date of birth and address down to come in uh, and see me and i kept going to sort of speak to officers a week later or two weeks later and say well has my son been approved to visit and they kept looking him up or me up on uh, nomis which is this very 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 old database that they still have in prisons um, and they said, no, he's not been approved. He's not, he's not an official visitor. And I, I sort of said, well, why is that? It's been weeks now. And they said, well, they're, they're checking out his criminal background. They'll be checking out his criminal history. And I said, well, he's, he's not even four yet. Um, and, but that's, the, that's what you're up against. You're up against a very kind of Kafkaesque, belligerent bureaucracy. Um, um, so it took about five weeks to get him approved to visit. And then, and then he could come in and see me. The other big difficulty as well, when I first went inside, was talking to him on the phone. Um, I had that one, so they, you get an emergency two minute phone call with anybody you want. But then after that, again, lots of forms have to be filled in, um, lots of bureaucracy just to get. Um, I got my telephone number application form sent in. Uh, but again, it took weeks uh, in order for me to get the telephone number of my ex so that I could call and speak to Kim. Finally, that got me to okay, but in those first weeks, I was locked up. So today, which has actually got worse now with the pandemic. Most prisoners are locked up for 23 hours a day. Um, uh, and the only phones are out on the landing. So you, you get only a tiny window to actually get out the cell, get to a phone and call. Um, and quite a lot of the time when I was first locked up, um, that was, I think, at like 10 in the morning. And of course, he was at nursery. So I'd call, I'd talk to Lottie and say, well, I'm alive, you know, how's it all going and stuff. But I couldn't speak to Kit because he was at nursery. And then when he got home from nursery, I was in my cell. So that was another sort of problem to overcome. Um, now, I was more fortunate than most people in that prison in the sense that I was quite educated. Um, I kind of, I can deal with authority figures. I know how to sort of negotiate difficult situations, I guess. Um, so what I did is I started getting lots and lots of jobs. I started doing a whole range of prison jobs because the, the offices are so overworked and there aren't enough staff in prisons that actually, if you go up and say, oh, can I help you do X, Y, Z? They, they, they would say, okay, yes, if you don't sort of mess, mess about, you, you can get out your cell and help us, which is what I did. But getting out my cell to help the officers meant I could then scurry off to pick up the phone and call home. So I ended up, I went a bit mad with this. So I ended up doing about seven jobs by the end, which just meant, and each job, got me out of the cell for an extra bit of time in the day. And, and one of the most ridiculous jobs that I did was I, um, I did the register. I, I would take people's names as they left the wing, which I absurd because I'm a prisoner and I could just lie and say someone was here when they weren't here. I was like, what are you but it meant I got out of the cell 20 minutes earlier in the morning 
uh, uh, which meant I could call him before school. So we could call him before school at nursery and call him when he got back. So things like that help. Back to visits. Initially, you only get two visits a month, which I thought was, I couldn't believe it when I saw this, that two one hour visits a month was the, the allowance. What's called standard issue prisoners. Prisoners all have these silly grades. So you come as a standard prisoner, two visits a month is all, is all you're allowed. And I, I, I was, you know, Rose talked about this a great deal. I won't repeat it, but obviously it's known by everybody that prisoners who maintain family ties are less likely to reoffend. And they had posters up saying this. They said, make sure you maintain family ties, otherwise you'll reoffend. So we want you to maintain family ties. And you go, great. How often can I see my son? Oh, twice a month. Um, it, 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 yeah, it was the sort of hypocrisy of that made me quite angry. But anyway, but the more brown nosing I did, I then became an enhanced level prisoner. And I was enhanced, which means you get four visits a month. So it's like an extra privilege um, that, you, uh, that, that you get. So I was on four visits a month, one a week. That was manageable. One a fortnight I couldn't cope with. But something psychologically about being able to see the next visit in front of you was, was I, I would go back to my cell and I'd think, oh, I'm going to see him again next Sunday. And Lottie was brilliant. She brought him in every week. But as Rose said, in a lot of cases, that doesn't happen. A lot of prisoners lose track of their kids, especially if they split up their partners. I'm writing a new book and I was actually just sitting with a lad just now. He's, he's come out of prison. He was inside for two years. And he split up with his girlfriend, the mother of his son, while he was inside. So for the first year, he was with the mum and she was bringing the boy in every week. But then they split up and then she stopped bringing the child in. And then it's up to the grandmother to bring the child in. So it all gets a lot more um, uh, complicated. Um, and it, look, there were other things that I could do. So he learned to read actually while I was inside. Uh, so I would write him letters. Uh, and then after a while, I then started writing him stories. Um, so I would get prisoners who had much better artistic skills than me to draw animals. I'd give them a piece of paper, and I'd give them a tin of tuna, and they'd draw some animals on a piece of paper. Then I would take that back and I would write a story around those animals. It took up a lot of time, which was great. because That's the one thing you need in prison is distraction. Uh, and, and he would love them and he'd open them and then I'd call him and he, 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 he would sort of read them back to me over the phone. And that, that really, really helped. Um, and there's this thing called uh, Touch Notes, which is an app you can get on your phone. And Lottie got this app and it's absolutely extraordinary. I'd recommend every, every, every partner that has someone in prison to get this. Because what it does is you just go to your photos and then you press the app button. And it, what it does is it automatically somewhere, I think it's in the Isle of Wight, it prints these off as a postcard and posts them to where you want to go. So it's like an automatic postcard service, but it's extremely simple. You just go do that one. And it's got the address saved. So Lottie would send me two or three um, touch notes every week, which was sort of photos of what just, just what Kit had been up to. So I could sort of track, you know, he went to the zoo or he went to, on a play date or went to the park or whatever. She would sort of send me these like these photo stories of his week, really. Um, and I could keep them all in my cell. I, would, I had them all kind of up on my wall and I had, had about 100 by the end. It was this sort of huge. I've still got them it's covered in toothpaste. You stick things on the wall with toothpaste. Um, so, you know, things like that were, um, were a huge help. Now, some prisons do um, what are called family days, uh, and family days are absolutely fantastic. So there's one thing I've always said that prisons can do to really, really help um, the problem of, you know, parents with kids in prison um, uh, is, sorry, parents who have kids who are in prison, um, is family days. So Wandsworth did these, and they were brilliant. So rather than the standard visits, there's only so much you can do in a standard visit. They're one hour long. And everyone has to be seated. And ones would let him come and sit on my lap, which was great. A lot of prisoners don't like that, but he would sit on my lap. It's still an hour. It's still very impressive. You sat down. You can't stand up. Young kids, like the kid was sort of four at this time. He wanted to play. He wanted to run around and play. And I was like, well, I can't stand up or I'll you know, get, get sandwiched by a couple of big officers. So the, um, the family days were sort of much more liberal and relaxed. So um, you could wear your own clothes on a family day, which is a really big deal because norm, normal visits, everyone wears bibs. It's like you're the world's worst bas basketball team. Everyone's wearing purple bibs to identify you as a prisoner. Um, but on family days, you don't have to, which is, you know, and you can, the other thing on family days is you can get up and you can run around. So they put in Wandsworth, they put, take away all the tables in the visits hall, they put down these mats and they've all these toys out and they had cake and they had games and it was brilliant and you just spend i would spend four hours a very physical relationship with my son so i could spend you could roll around together and play it and you know bounce around at a little sort of play pit and you could bounce around in there 
and they were great. They were like the one moment where you sort of forgot you were in prison. Um, and if there's anything that prisons can do to have more family days, then uh, uh, they made um, they made an extraordinary difference. So a kind of combination of all these things meant we just kind of kept the lifeline going um, through that time. Um, we were quite honest with Kit about what happened to me. Lofty thought, again, honesty is the best policy because um, you'll find out. Um, so there was this thing, daddy's done something wrong. He helped some people take some money that wasn't theirs. And he's gone to, he's very sorry. He's gone to prison for it. Um, but we, she didn't use the word prison, funnily enough. She said the building, Daddy's, daddy lives in the building and we're going to go see him. He was too young to really be freaked out by the authoritarian nature of the place. Um, he, when he went in, he just saw it as the place where daddy lived. Kids that are older get really traumatized by it because they see the guards and they see the gates and the dogs and the sort of the CCTV and the, the, the whole environment really upsets them. But thankfully, general consensus is five and under, they don't get it. They're just happy to be able to sort of see their, see their parent. So we called it the building, but we didn't sort of uh, lie about it. Um, uh, but, and again, I think that's quite important. Again, I'm not judging other people, but uh, what, I was quite open when I went down. I said, look, okay, we did do this. We did, you know, put all the figures, did make it a film, mate. You know, fuck it, sorry. Um, but lots of people, when they go down, they're still in denial. They're still telling their family and friends they didn't do it and it wasn't them. And they, uh, they sort of have this idea of denial. And the problem is if you put that denial on the kid, the kid just feels more resentful. And if you say, no, daddy didn't really do this, the child is more likely to mistrust authority and this feeling of resentment and causes all these other problems. So we were very straight with him about that. Um, and look, he's still, he's very, very close to me. I'm up in Manchester today and he's terrified I'm not gonna come back. He was crying the night before I went because he, he was worried that me going away to Manchester was like prison and I'm not gonna come back. And so it has really, really affected him, but it, we're extraordinarily close. We're probably closer than I've, we've ever been because of it because he's just so clean on me. So it, it, it's been very tough, but we got through it basically. Um, so anyway, I mean, I've probably gone over my time now, so I'm sorry, it's something I feel very passionate about, but I will leave it to our next, uh, our next guest to, to carry on the conversation. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I could listen to you talk about your experience for, for much longer than you have, so thank, thank you for that. I mean, it's interesting you saying about the hypocrisy of um, posters saying, you know, maintain family ties, it's so important for you, yet they don't make it easy at all. Um, I mean, I think recently purple visits have been sort of the the new um issue we've had so it was a great thing during covid because it meant people could still actually have that contact but little children can't do it they don't recognize little kids face that's moving around everywhere and it would just cut out for security reasons so you know even technology now um in in the prison system trying to make things better has has its difficulties too um thanks thanks again and um, we're going to move on to charlie now from uh, safe safe ground Thanks, Kate. Um, thanks to everyone. And I'm really aware of the audience and the fact that most of the people in this audience could equally be a panelist. So there's nothing I'm going to say that nobody hasn't either thought or heard or said a million times, which is a bit daunting. But I am here. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm here because my name is Charlie and I am the director of Safe Ground. Uh, a very small national organisation who have been running family programmes in prison for 20 of our 26 years. Um, we began our work in prisons when we were commissioned by, as was the Home Office, before the MOJ existed, to design and deliver the first ever family relationships programmes. And it's interesting, I think Rose mentioned the Farmer Review, which everyone will be familiar with, but at that time, when we were commissioned to design Family Man and Father Inside, there was a massive piece of research that was fresh off the press from the Social Innovation or Social Interventions Unit, which at the time was the kind of darling of social innovation that had established that maintaining family ties was really important for the reduction of recidivism. And here we are 20 years later, being surprised about the fact that family, people in prison, there's an important correlation. Um, so thanks for that prompt, Rose. It reminded me. Um, Safe Grounds therapeutic group work uses drama and involves family members in an intensive group work programme over four weeks. 
where pre-COVID, on average, 17 men, it's quite a large group, between 17 and 20 men, would work together to really consider their own experiences of being both parented and a parent. Our work uses attachment theory, transactional analysis, reflective group work and drama in combination to generate the transformational outcomes that we have a really strong evidence base for and which I would be delighted to talk about for hours on end. But I am actually here to talk about the relevance of this guide for fathers in prison wanting to develop their contact with children. When I looked at the guide, it was obvious how necessary it is and really <laughs> kind of uh, brought into stark question yet again, how come it hasn't ever existed before? What, what do people do? Um, and I had several responses, which I hope are helpful and at least can go somewhere to pay a tiny tribute to the hundreds of men that we work with each year, many of whom will not have seen their children for a very long time, not just because of COVID, but particularly as a result of COVID. So firstly, Chris in his foreword in the guide and then Rose in her opening remarks have already paid tribute to, in Chris's case, Lottie, his partner, and the support that she offered. And it, the first thing I wanted to say was, in my experience over the last 11 years, the vast majority of the men that we work with will have a partner, an ex-partner, a mum, a sister, a friend, who, or a grandma, who supports them and brings their children to visit under extremely difficult circumstances, very often traveling very long distances to make sure that contact is, is sustained. Secondly, Chris mentions in his forward the importance of letter writing and storytelling. And again, they're elements of relationship that we spend a lot of time and attention on in our work, uh, looking for and developing ways for dads to sustain meaningful relationships and communication with their children. And during COVID, Safe Ground, along with others, have spent a lot of time and effort developing a range of valuable resources for men to do that. However, Supporting men to sustain communication when children don't respond or when men don't know if their letters are getting delivered or read is extremely difficult. And it's another part of the puzzle. And that's kind of the bit that we do. It's hard to keep believing your role as dad is important when in your mind, you're getting nothing back. You're just writing into a vacuum. Keeping relationships alive is at least as much a psychological process as it is a practical and material one. And that's why the work of Safe Ground is so important to me and why I think a guide like this is so vital to complement and inform it. The guide is structured in a really clear and ordered fashion. Rose took us through it earlier, but I think that is really helpful for people consumed by chaos. Part of the Fathers Inside course deals with uh, the notion of parental responsibility, which as Rose has already said, is where the guide begins. And it clearly explains the technical, legal, emotional and practical elements of the term and gives really clear structured guidance. And I've already spoken to Rose and Prisoners Advice Service about how we can integrate the guide with our Family Man and Fathers Inside programmes, the direct group work, um, so if anyone wants to fund another 200 guides for delivery in those sessions, let us know, let PAS know, because without it won't happen. Um, whilst a lot of the men that we work with either don't have or don't want parental responsibility, at least as many do. And often face an absolute quandary of confusion, misinformation, lack of clarity around what their rights are and what the procedures are in order for them to exercise those rights. The common refrain of that bitch won't let me see my kids will be familiar to many people on this call and is often the starting point for difficult and pivotal conversations about avoiding going to court, about child welfare, about children's needs and the impact of parental separation, parental contact on children. This guide is extremely helpful in enabling men to understand how protection orders work, how risk to children might be assessed, 
and what he might need to do in order to change his access rights. In our work, we come across hundreds of families who want to protect their children from knowing dads in prison, just like Chris was saying. And I've been to more oil rigs and chocolate factories than I can remember. And a lot of the work we do with men and families is supporting them to find sensitive and appropriate, sustainable ways of telling their children the truth about where they are and of learning to navigate the legal, welfare, care, health, housing and criminal justice systems more effectively, thereby experiencing help and support that actually brings tangible benefits to families. Over the years, there's a million stories that stay with me. Um, the little boy lying on the floor with his arms linked around his dad's ankles at the end of a family day on father's side. And we had to prize the child off his dad and watch his dad walk away at the end of the visit. The dad whose wife was also in jail and whose elderly parents were looking after their children. But everyone knew those long sentences meant that before either of them were released from jail, alternative arrangements were gonna to have to be made. The guy we were working with in a group in Wales whose children were in care in London and wanted to come and see him, but whose social worker wouldn't allow it. And the young man in Weatherby whose 16 year old girlfriend came to visit him with their month old baby. And that visit had been arranged by the three social workers. Each of those human beings had a social worker, the boy, the girl and the child. And those three social workers collaborated to create that visit. And I draw on those illustrations to suggest that these are often extremely complex circumstances with hugely nuanced, intricate detail that needs really clear thinking experience, confidence and knowledge of extremely convoluted law. And often this work is left to either volunteers or staff who have little to no, certainly legal training, if family training. Um, and I don't think that's good enough. And I think in conclusion, a guide like this provides invaluable, clear information and helps men, but also practitioners, prison officers, key workers, probation staff separate material reality, the law, from emotion and the feelings related to a sense of often huge injustice that may or may not be rooted in reality. And I very much look forward to being able to use it. And thank you very much indeed to Rose and Prisons Advice Service and everyone involved in its creation. Thanks very much, Charlie. Um, the the example of of a of a child being prized off his father. So because he didn't want to leave on on family day is absolutely um, absolutely devastating. But it's actually. That happens frequently up and down the country, unfortunately. Um, not so much at the moment because of COVID, but um, it, it does. And I think one of the other examples you gave of, of both parents being in prison is actually particularly um, particularly difficult in an area, in a minefield basically, where people don't know um, what to do. Um, I have quite a few clients who's, who's both, you know, both parents are in prison and it's, it's absolutely devastating for them. Um, you talk about you know so many different strands being involved and and actually who needs to know about this so that they can help um the, the men in prison because it's it's not just you it's not just rose it's not Paz, it's not just a, a amanda it has to be a joint effort because we all have different specialities you know different specialisms and, and we all need to work together to try and improve outcomes for, for, for men in prison um, okay, we're going to move on to Amanda now, who's our last panellist to speak. Amanda. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, some of the things have, um, have already been covered a little bit by Rose. And when um, Charlie spoke about her, some of the case studies, it's brought back so many memories for me and family days and some of the layers of the issues that I, I go through with casework with both parents in prison and just the effects that imprisonment generally has on children. Well, in my speech, I'm going to discuss how I support dads with child contact in my role as the Prison Advice Care Trust Family Engagement Manager at my uh, male open prison. So I'm there to support dads to maintain and build the family ties. So family work, it has always been important in custody. 
um, impact I've done relationship work for a long time. They came up with the idea of family engagement workers to work in prisons, support with relationships and contact issues. The work has received more recognition in the last few years due to the farm reports, which Rose has already mentioned, because the family is supposed to be the golden thread that runs through the prisons. This is something that I'm continually promoting in the prison, and I've been fortunate enough to write the family strategy for the prison that I work in. It still obviously needs development and it's a live document. So with everything that's going on, and I do want to consult with families and prisoners and develop that um, strategy further to help the family service. Um, right from the start, when I first started working in the prison three and a half years ago, it was clear that casework with family contact issues was a major theme. And um, there's definitely a need for support with that in prison. So I've been able to support dads with this um, through working with them. Also I've got volunteers and a peer worker, which is a, someone that's trained as a prisoner. Uh, to deliver the family work. So I support with child issues and it's really, it's really valued by the men I've noticed. So I give them advice and I can offer some basic mediation with the families and offer emotional support around child contact issues. I can also liaise with social services and support with the court process if necessary. So with the launch of this guide, it's gonna make it a lot more easier to do this because sometimes I can give all the information which I've read online or just from my experience of casework. But having this guide, I'll be able to reflect on it and use it and also give it out to the men so then they can go back to their rooms. It's a lot to take in sometimes when I'm sat there saying, have you got PR of the child? And I have to explain that and then go through the whole thing. But then they can have the guide. They can go back and reflect on it and come back to me if they've got any questions. And it's just gonna be really good to use that and it's a clear guide and it gives realistic case studies which I think a lot of the men are going to be able to relate to so I can't wait to start using that. Uh, when I support dads with the court, court process I do use my experience from other cases and I do offer advice emotional support like I said and sometimes I can do a statement supporting statement with the court paperwork which sometimes makes it a little bit easier if I can write I've been supporting this man in custody, some such and such a course. Um, if you need any more information, go back to me. Because obviously men in custody haven't got a phone that they can just ring up and say, oh, you missed your national insurance number off, which sometimes can make the whole form come back just because they've missed that off. So if they can just have my contact details, I can get things like that sorted quickly. And also in my prison, we've got new IT equipment now. So a lot of men will be able to go to family court hearings via video link, which is a big thing. Sometimes it's difficult to get the men out or if they haven't got rottle or it's just going to make it so much easier. So I'll be able to support with that as well. Either sit with them during the process or just support them after and before, give them advice and prepare them for it. So having the family strategy in the prison and doing packed hidden sentence training, it has helped develop the family approach in prisons, but obviously there's still a lot more work to do. Um, prison is becoming more family focused and more aware of the impact it has on children. So on family days that I offer, I also invite different prison officers each time. And I have found that the family days have inspired some prison officers and it really has a change, changed their approach to how they talk to prisoners and how they speak to children. I've had some real stern officers who've got down to children's level and it's just changed the whole approach. So hopefully we're going to continue to do that. Um, there's so much work to do on that obviously but hopefully it's a good thing so I'm really passionate about PAC's ethos to minimise the impact of imprisonment that it has on dads and families so I believe that children do deserve to have a good relationship with their dad even when they in, are in custody and I do try my best to support families to achieve this so to help with contact like I said I do mediation, emotional support, advice and sometimes I can help them with basic parenting plans. Uh, when contact is more complex, I can su support dads with liaison with social services, probation, CAFCAS, and the court process. So I have supported quite a lot of men with child contact issues and they have managed to achieve positive outcomes for many. So when the outcomes can't be achieved or when restrictions don't allow them, this is when I help men to manage their expectations. So some contact has been able to be achieved through mediation with families and also through mediating with social services. 
So I've used just my skills and experience from PACT and knowledge to do this and to support families. Um, it's also helpful to make families and professionals aware what is available in prison. Sometimes even professionals and families, they just think of prison to see the bars and it's not a nice place. Um, but the prison that I work in, it's an open prison. And when you come to a visit, you wouldn't necessarily think it was a prison. It's lots of grass and it's a really friendly, nice environment. So making them aware of that is really helpful. And making them aware that we do have family days and what we do on them. And I do also facilitate special visits, which are a private visit from everyone else and really bespoke to the, the need of the visit and the child. So a little bit about domestic visits. Some dads do enjoy domestic visits with their children. Um, I'm able to go down and speak to families on visits and just make them presents now and offer any support. Sometimes they travelled a long way, just don't want to talk about that. Or sometimes they want to have more specific support around talk to their children about if they're if deciding whether they want to tell their children they're in prison. So I can give them advice on that and use, we've got a book called Locked Out. I can go through that and give them ideas how to talk to their children about being in prison. For my prison, I've also made a booklet for the children to see prior to the visit with photos and pictures of all the prisons so they can see where their dad sleeps. That's sometimes a worry for children. See, where they eat and where they go to the gym and all things like that. So that's been really helpful. Um, I can also talk about um, what things we've got to offer families for support and visits. And now when I go down to visits, I will be able to promote this guide to families. And um, so that'll be helpful. And also signpost it to professionals because sometimes we have social workers on visits, bringing children in for contacts though. So be able to signpost them to the guide and everything. So that'd be good. Um, yeah, the family days, I do the family days in my prison and they are different to normal visits, they're longer, we do really nice activities and I get the men involved with the family day, they do the whole planning of it, so it is specifically for their children, they do plan it all. We normally have a theme as well, um, so they're totally child-centred, lots of activities so they can hopefully have some nice special memories with the children. We have had loads of positive feedback from the visits, which is really good. And it is really clear to see after a visit the just how happy everyone is. So after a visit, I do stay behind and men can come back and speak to me. Sometimes it can cause quite a lot of emotions and it's hard for them to say goodbye to the family and the children. Um, there is other ways to stay in contact with the children. So I'll talk a little bit about that now. Dads can stay in touch with uh, non-face-to-face -face things, which obviously has had to happen a lot during COVID when the visits have not been able to happen. So like we've mentioned before, the purple visits, they can't replace face-to-face -face visits, but they have been really helpful in replace. So for this, I've helped men with, by giving them conversation starters and some jokes and just things to do. Uh, letters are really good as well. I do try and encourage the men to write to their children and how important that is. And if they've got literacy issues, I will signpost them to a peer worker that can help them with that. I'll print them colouring sheets off. Um, we've also had help, um, pack packets that we've used to send out to families so the parents and the children can do those. Um, phone contact is another thing. Uh, way of keeping in touch, which a lot of people use with their children. I can help them with that by giving them conversation starters again and jokes and things to help with that. Also, I'll facilitate the call if I need to, if it's got to be supervised or if it's, um, if they just restarted contact again, they might need a bit more support with it. And in my prison, we have Russell, which men can apply for, which is released on temporary license. So men can use this to um, have contact with their children. Um, which is really good and they can also use their phone a bit more and have face-to-face -face, um, talks with the children because we also use Rattle for paid employment in the community. This can also help when um, if they want to contribute financially. And I'm just going to mention a little bit about the packed courses that we deliver. We've um, got loads of different parenting ones, um, positive relationship ones that we can deliver and they can help with maintaining contact. One course that we deliver is called FLIP, Family Literacy in Prison, which um, they learn all about literacy and how they can help develop their children's literacy and then they get an educational 
visit with a child where they get to put all their skills and knowledge into practice, which is really good. Um, yeah, services obviously haven't been able to operate as normal because of the COVID, but with restrictions, I still feel like I have supported families as much as I can in the prison and the men. Um, but hopefully with restrictions lifting, I just want to do my best to make sure the family days are as special as possible. Um, and I want to make sure I involve the families with the planning of, and development of the family strategy. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks very much, Amanda. I mean, clearly, PAC do amazing, vital work with uh, with men and actually with women. You know, I, I work predominantly with with women um, in, in custody and I am heavily reliant on the PAC workers to to help um, me through the legal process with with um, with prisoners. So you do a fantastic job. I think it's interesting, actually, that um, all four of you have touched on the fact that prison isn't necessarily a bad place for a child to, to go and visit. Um, I think a lot of people who don't work in this area do think that it's it, it's scary, it's not child friendly, um, you know, there's no way it would be a positive experience. But, but in actual fact, um, things are getting better. And yeah, we can't get around security and control issues, which are intimidating, but they, um, they're getting better and, and positive experiences are, you know, are often had. So, um, Hopefully, with the easing of COVID restrictions, visits will start properly um, again across the estate and they will um, get to have that physical contact again. Um, thanks very much to all of our, um, all of our panellists today. Great contributions from all of them. Um, we're going to have a quick Q&A session now for anyone who has a question. We had some submitted to us prior to the event. So, I thought I would deal with those first and then deal with any others that came through um, subsequent to that. So it's probably best to deal with the COVID related questions first because um, Amanda has already touched on the fact that obviously things have been different and Charlie did too um, for the last 15 or so months. Um, so we, we had a couple of, of, of questions about this. Um, and I thought that maybe Amanda and Charlie would like to, to comment on them and actually potentially Chris on, on one too. Um, so one of the questions was, what do you think about the reduction of father-child contact since COVID restric restrictions and the slowness of releasing these inside? And how have COVID restrictions affected fathers inside? So why don't I go to Charlie first? Thanks. Um, I think I would start by saying prison isn't a good deal for anyone under any circumstances ever. Um, and I think although some children have great benefit from seeing dad, even when dad's in prison, the environment, the conditions, the circumstance, I would say is far from ideal. Um, I think COVID disabled the already the already limited contact that Chris talked about, two visits a month down to nothing over 16 months. I think it's hard to imagine what that is and what that means for both dad and child. And I think the limitations on the time that were enabled by purple visits or phone credits, the limitations on time, the frequency and access to those visits. And I think, I can't remember who it was, I don't know if it was Rose or Kate that talked about the, the limits on the size and age of the child and the number of children. Parents were having to choose which child went on a purple visit. So while in principle, great, there's something. In practice, actually, how is it possible that at least 20 years on from understanding the correlation between family ties and reducing reoffending, if that's your principal goal, are you still unable to understand that people have more than one child and those children may be small? So that when you're building IT systems and software design, that comes as a surprise to you. I think if that were happening anywhere else outside of prison, it would be an absolute outcry. Um, I think, 
every cell should have a, a phone in it that can receive incoming calls at any time that would stop men abusing access to women's homes, for example, and calling them at four o'clock in the morning, going, where have you been? But would enable the women or the partners or the grandmas to phone and say, Tommy wants to talk to you. I think family allowances calls to men to make out should be made a standard. I think the price of prison, prison phone calls is a public outcry that needs attention. And the first man in prison that I ever spoke to is now on my board. Uh, when I started work at Safe Ground, I was going to some policy event at the House of Lords and I said, what should I say is my primary? I've been in the job a week. I said, what should I talk about? He said, the price of prison phone calls, Charlie. Well, here we are. We're still, I would still say. And uh, stamps for parents, men should be given stamps. There's no excuse for not sending a letter. So in terms of COVID restrictions, we're in a pandemic. That's a difficult situation to deal with. There's some pretty basic stuff you could have been getting right before it happened. I wasn't sure if you'd finished or not. <laughs> I'll take it that you have as you're eating your orange. <laughs> No, I, th I think you're completely right that, you know, the, there was so much before COVID happened. And I think now, um, certainly from my experience uh, and others at PAS, you know, they're just using COVID now as an excuse. Um, oh, well, the pandemic, the pandemic, the pandemic. Um, there's not anything that I've asked about where they haven't said, oh, but you know, it's COVID. Um, and, and actually, they've just got to do better. They've got to do much better and, and really try and make up for that lost time, which is going to take years and the damage that that has been caused by children not being able to see their parents in prison over the last 16 months you're right um is 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 devastating and is is going to be long lasting um i'm i'm very sure of it um chris how how do you think being in prison during covid would have would have affected you and your relationship with your with your son um, yeah, I, I've got a bit of an insight into this because one of the things I did alongside my book when I got out, was I interviewed lots of prisoners about other prisoners about their experiences inside for a podcast series, which is also called a bit of a stretch. And one of and I was making it, and then the pandemic happened, so I sort of ended up doing one of those episodes on on the pandemic, and I was getting calls from mothers and wives and I was getting calls from people inside prison talking to me about it or people were tweeting me about sort of stories and problems they were having so I kind of became a kind of conduit for a lot of this um and one there's one story in particular that I just wanted to sort of tell you because it became this whole thing it was a, 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 a mum tweeted me a photo a letter that she had received from uh, a prison I'm just trying to remember the name of the prison but Anyway, it, it, it's quite indicative of the whole problem. Basically, that during um, a visit, I think this is between lockdowns, between lockdown one and two, I think, they just started doing visits again. So the child hadn't seen dad for sort of six months. And they went into the visit. At the end of the visit, the child, I think it was three, ran up and hugged the dad. Um, and that's, um, which is often a problem. You can tell the child, you're not supposed to hug the parent because of COVID restrictions, but a three-year-old toddler, how do they, you know, grass, they want to hug their dad. So they ran up and hugged the dad and she was sort of told off at the time. And then two to two, two days later, she got a letter basically saying, because of that hug, the dad has had to go into segregation. I mean, they say quarantine, but they mean what it is, is full 24 hour segregation. And your child has now been banned from coming in. So we're banning the child indefinitely. And they, they I mean, Prison systems make these horrendously inhumane decisions every day, but they were so stupid to put it in writing. So she tweeted it to me. I retweeted it and just, I think the strap line was welcome to the British prison system. That's all I put. And it had like 30,000 retweets and likes. And it, was just, it went viral and everyone was going nuts about it. And like two days later, they changed their mind and said, oh, well, actually, maybe the child can come back in after all. But that, it, it, that's just, to me, it was just one example, but it sort of shone a light on how sort of crazy the whole that the whole system was the, the person I've just been talking to earlier they uh, he 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 was inside during the pandemic and his child couldn't come in because the governor I think it's the HMP Wymot I think it was in Manchester said no children under 10 that was the governor's own rule arbitrary 
that's nothing nice fact sheet, there's no guideline for this. It was no children under 10 for that very reason that kids under 10 won't understand the no hugging rule. So we're just going to ban them all. As soon as they get to 10, you can come and see your dad. So it, yeah, had a, had a catastrophic impact. And I'm so lucky that I wasn't inside during the pandemic because all the stuff we would, I was talking about in my talk, yeah, it wouldn't have happened. I've had phone calls and letters, but that would be it. And I wouldn't be as close to my son now as I am. It just it wouldn't have been the case without the contact and stuff. So it, it, it's, it's, it's been appalling. And no, I don't think any real allowances were made. There was, a prison, there was an early release scheme that was set up. And they initially talked about, I think, 2,000 prisoners or 4,000 prisoners they were going to let out on the early release. And then they ended up letting out about 80, something farcical like that. You know, and even in Iran, in Iran, they, they let Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe. I mean, it's horrendous what's happened there, but she was allowed out on sort of compassion. Leave. <laughs> they didn't do that in Britain. So Iran had a more humane uh, approach to lots of countries were letting people out early or letting them go stay with their families and stuff. And Britain was like, no. I'm just going to make it worse. So yeah, it's been horrible. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. I mean, I, I, I think we were we were all pulling our hair out with the uh, temporary release schemes because they were just not utilised, um, and it was absolutely shocking. I mean, there was a special one for pregnant women, and I think only a third of pregnant women were released um, temporarily during the pandemic. So, I mean, uh, uh, shocking decisions on the part of HMPPS, um, shocking decisions and policy positions taken by prisons as well but that's when you should get in touch with PAS because we can judicially review very 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 stupid decisions so we are here to help um, with that. Um, right next question um, can the panel describe any socio-economic consequences of separating families and placing fathers in prison? I thought Rose I might ask you about this because you touched on it sort of briefly um, in your in your actual um, discussion contribution. And then I think Charlie's quite eager to have, have her say too. So, so socioeconomic consequences of allowing, allowing contact, Kate, do you mean? Sorry, I'm not quite clear. Sorry, of separating families and putting, um, putting fathers in prison. Well, I mean, there are there are very obvious consequences um, of placing somebody in prison, and they simply can't work. I mean, there are, there are what prison services might call sort of jobs. Of course, even the ones that are paid are paid basically slave wages, but that's another soapbox that we will come to another day. Um, but yeah, so obviously, putting somebody into prison is going to mean that they can't work. Um, when it comes to sentencing, I mean, I, I just finished my last sort of criminal trial ever. But um, certainly having done plenty of plenty of years worth of sentencing hearings and various types of criminal hearings, things like, listen, the family's going to find this really, really difficult if, if the main breadwinner is put into prison. You know, that's going to have an impact on the three children they have because mum can't work for these reasons. She's got an infant, etc. Judges don't really take it into account. I think there's no requirement for them to do so, really. Um, the sentencing guidelines keep getting overhauled seemingly on a yearly basis, and yet don't take into account any kind of sort of human aspects in that sense. Um, so yeah, there are very, very obvious financial implications of separating families in that way. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's that's really all I can add, certainly from, from the point at which people go into prison. Um, I don't know if Charlie's got more to say about it from, from a sort of longer term impact, but that, I mean, it's so blindingly obvious. Yeah, if you, if you get put into prison, you can't work. So yeah, there are financial consequences to that. Great, thanks, Rose. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Charlie? Yeah, I mean, I kind of wish the audience could get involved in the conversation because I know there's people in the audience who have much more to say, or at least as much. But just, you know, in my experience working at Safe Ground and previous to that, the burden of the financial and socioeconomic consequences of men going to prison often falls on women predominantly and often family members are left getting into debt and trying to deal with men's debt that accumulates in prison and that can start off unwittingly and very quickly escalate and navigating that for someone on the outside whose loved one is inside and asking for help under duress and coercion is really, really difficult. 
the levels of stigma and exclusion and isolation that often women but other family members feel and talk about very frequently as a result of having a family member in prison, particularly a partner or their co-parent. You know, some families move home to be near the person that's gone to jail, uproot their children and change their children's schools so that they're going to be able to visit dad while he's serving a long sentence. Um, I think there's myriad socioeconomic punishments that fall out of someone being sent to prison that very often get overlooked and I've noticed Shona I don't know if Shona's still in the audience but she, I, I was at an event years ago at Cambridge and there was an um, academic speaking and he said that family relationships in prison is one of the fastest growing areas of research in academia over the last 10 years and yet the assisted prison visit scheme has had its budget cut etc etc and we're still having this conversation unfortunately we're still having it as you say um okay someone has asked is anyone in prison able to mediate contact with children as part of promoting family ties for example the chaplaincy or omu i mean we've already heard obviously that PACT can help with that, but I don't know, um, Amanda, if you're, from your experience, you could say who else might be able to assist too? Uh, yeah, I do a lot of the mediation work with families and OMU do a lot of it as well. Um, and outside probation can also do support as well. Um, going forward with the CRC, getting back, um, or to MPS, there's going to be new roles such as wellbeing advisors, which may be able to help with mediation. They may start supporting men in custody quite close to release and that work might cover some of the mediation um, and support with family ties. Um, sometimes prisons have specialists come in like lawyers and clinics and dropping the things. They can help with the mediation as well. In my prison, we've got the Genesis Project currently and they do a lot of family work and they'd probably have to support with mediation and family work as well. Great, so it's kind of a case of who's available in the specific prison that you're in. Yeah, and the person that the prison get, the prisoner gets on with and built a relationship with and has got family mediation would be the best person for them to go to. Brilliant, thanks. And actually another one for you, Amanda, and I think it's going to have to be our last one because I noticed that the time is pushing on, is um, with the shattered mental health induced by, you know, COVID restrictions, we, we know that everyone suffered, but prisoners have suffered certainly the most. Um, are there any plans to make it up in any way to prisoners and their children and families by, you know, for example, increasing the number of family days, increasing the ways that children can have contact with their dads? Yeah, I have noticed the mental health of the prisoners and the families. I've supported them all the way through the pandemic and I've done a lot more family support. And the main theme is the impact it has on them, it had on the men and the families not having that contact with the children. So for me, definitely, I want to make the family days as, as good as possible. And if I can do more, then I will do more. And I want to promote to the prison. They need to continue with the purple visits, which we didn't have previously. And all the other things that we've had in addition, they can't stop now. They need to continue with it to enhance what's available and try and... I don't think we can ever make up for what's happened in the pandemic, but just try and give them as much as we can now. Um, I don't know about other prisons, if they can do that as well. Hopefully they'll have as much passion in that to offer that to families as well. Yeah, great, thanks. I mean, I think now that prisons are moving, nearly all prisons are in stage three, some are in stage two. Hopefully they will be looking at ways to um, try and rebuild the damage that has been caused and you know the, 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 the pain and um, suffering that all involved have experienced. But um, you know I think all of us involved need to do our best as you say to try and encourage them, <laughs> give them a kick up the arse <laughs> to, to get on with that. Um, I think that's all we've got time for with questions. The ones that I didn't get to, I'm very happy to send answers to um, 
to those who sent them in. Um, we actually had one from our, our own Nikki, but I think I can answer the question, Nikki, so I can tell you that separately. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Lubia now, who is going to um, do a close for us. Thank you very much, um, Kate. Um, I hang around these events normally so I can, at the very end, either Jeff or I can um, ask people for money, which is um, slightly more effective when you're there in person rather than um, digitally. Um, um, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm not gonna do that this time around. I just want to take this opportunity to um, thank a whole huge bunch of brilliant people. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, Thank you, um, Rose, for, for coming our way. You approached us, we didn't sort of chase you and hunt you down. Um, and in terms of thanking people, um, what I've found over the years is that preceding people parting with their time, their resources, their waiving their fees, writing out checks is a huge, huge amount of, of goodwill and commitment. And that's been shown in abundance by every single PAS staff member, and I don't like to blow our own trumpet, but over the last 15, 16 months, um, the staff and the trustees have been, we just carried on like nothing happened. It felt like we might have been the only people um, in the UK who hadn't realised there was a pandemic and we didn't have to work seven, eight hours every single day as normal with kids pulling our hair while we're trying to do the um, advice line. Um, a special thank you to our funders who understood the challenges that we were facing as we were trying to adapt our services to maximize um, the impact that we had. Um, and especially some, um, some of our major individual donors who were impacted quite badly by the um, pandemic, but still managed to support us because they understood what we were doing, why we we're trying to do that. So especially grateful to them. You know who you are. Um, and then our volunteers, such as Rose, even through the pandemic, when they weren't coming into the office, um, volunteers that we rely on really heavily, they carried on helping us. They were um, printing at home, they were logging into our system, doing letters, all sorts. And we've been, it's not often it happens, but in the last year, barristers, solicitors have emailed us, phoned us and said, how can we help? What can we do? I live in Manchester, is there something I can do? I don't live in, I live in Wales. I'd really like to do something for you, what can I do? And that's been really heartening, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, such a huge amount of goodwill all around, and I really appreciate that. So thank you again to um, everybody. Um, do check out our website on which there is a donate <laughs> page. Otherwise, have a very good rest of the um, evening, and hopefully see you all at our 30th anniversary celebrations. That's the next thing on your to-do list, Jeff. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to Cooley for hosting this event.